like Venkataraman, right? And then it's like... Good evening. Good evening, thank you for coming. I'm Cecil Giskin. I teach in the English department here, and please allow me to welcome you to the reading by Ed Roberson, the 2014 Roberta C. Holloway poet. Among the previous Holloway poets are such notable figures as Louise Glick, Michael Palmer, Paul, Mundoon, Paul Muldoon, Yusuf Komenyaka, Anne Carson, Mark McMorris, Judith Goldman, and last year, Keston Sutherland. Next year's Holloway poet will be Anna Moskovakis. Let me remind you briefly of the coming Holloway series events. Um, a reading and a mixed blood talk by C.D. Wright on the, on the 23rd of October. A reading by Clark Coolidge on the 4th of November. That's a Tuesday. And Tennessee Reed will read on November the 20th. Ed Roberson is the current Holloway poet. This lectureship came into existence in 1981 through a bequest given to the English department as part of the estate of Roberta C. Holloway, who received her BA degree in English with honors from UC Berkeley in 1923 and her PhD in English from UC Berkeley in 1945. I'll talk briefly about uh, Roberta Holloway's bequest. As a poet and uh, in due course, one with a PhD in English, it was her lifelong ambition to teach, even if only briefly at her alma mater. This opportunity never came to Roberta Holloway. She spent her teaching career at San Jose State. But as she reached the end of her life, she decided generously to make such an opportunity possible for other poets. She left what at the time was a fair amount of money to UC Berkeley's English department as a bequest to be devoted to bringing a poet for a semester to Berkeley to teach and enjoy the creative and intellectual uh, uh, community of the English department. As required by the terms of the bequest, the committee supervising the lectureship was chaired by Josephine Miles, as long as she was an active faculty member. Josephine Miles, uh, who died in 1985, was the first woman to be tenured in Berkeley's English department. She was a nationally recognized and much honored poet whose work uh, has, uh, now has canonical status in history of American poetry of the 20th century. Here's an offering to the traditions of this room, a poem by Josephine Miles. The poem is called Figure. A poem I kept forgetting to write is about the stars, how I see them in their order, even without the chair and bear and the sisters in their astronomic presence of great space, and how beyond and behind my eyes they are moving, exploding into spirals under extremist pressure. Having not mathematics, my head bursts with anguish of not understanding. The poem I forgot to write is bursting fragments of a tortured victim far from me in his galaxy of minds bent upon him, in the oblivion of his headline status crumpled and exploding as incomparable as a star, yet present in its light. I forget to write. And tonight, it's my honor to introduce to you the poet, Ed Roberson. I would begin by leaning on, on Roberson himself for language. In an interview for Fifth Wednesday, uh, a magazine from a suburban Chicago. The questions were of, of the how did you become a writer sort, but one of Ed Roberson's answers to a question about the influence of the natural world went further to the demands of his interviewers. He responded, I don't want to write something, I didn't want to write something that was just pretty. I wanted to write something not just because of the sound or the beauty thing, but because of something that was reaching much farther. The world setting is much bigger than one person. I was raised in a church, a Southern African Methodist church with all the emotional trimmings. I was never a real believer. But what I did believe in was that was what music of the stories allowed people to feel, what the musical structures of the religious allowed you to think or feel, how it could give you the experience of things so deep that you would break into tears. Whereas sitting in a bar, the stories don't move me that way. Communal as they are, those experiences don't go beyond the bar. So what I always wanted to do 
was not write the stuff that's pretty, but write the stuff that cut way deeper, that was almost terror to deal with, it was hard to look at, the things that scare you, that were hard to look at or listen to, that described those parts of the day when you just sort of sit down and have to shut up. It's best for me, um, it's best for me when I'm humbled into writing, or look at it, be silenced, but unable to stand up to it and write a poem that says, here's a response to the call of that moment, that music. It will make you think. I remember those sung sermons, the sermons of the black Southern preachers. Or I would begin by leaning again on Ed Roberson for language and talking about the first book, When Thy King is a Boy, published in 1970. The title is from Ecclesiastes. The labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them because he knoweth not how to go to the city. Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a boy and thy princess eat in the morning. And the last poem in the book, in that book, is on the calligraphy of black chant, which furnished the title for Alda Nielsen's study of African American postmodern poetry, Black Chant. That poem ends and any shot, either life or last of thieves, is the opposite of bleeding, is the opposite of bleeding, and not healed, and not healed. And not you. I am the sieve, and not you. I am the sieve, and not you. I am the sieve, and not healed, and not you. I am the sieve, and not your friend. I am the sieve, and not healed, and not you, I am the sieve, and not you, not your friend. I am the sieve, and not your friend. I am the sieve, I am the sieve. A chant, the essential characteristic of chant is the long reciting note to which an indefinite number of syllables are sung, followed by a rhythmic cadence, that's from the OED. Also, the rogues can't the argo of the underworld. Calligraphy, though, calligraphy is the hand. This is hand indicating severalness. If calligraphy is the hand, as we say, in which something is written, this is the cross poem, the act of language crossing over between song, argo, and whatever rural pen comes to hand. The voice and hand define, accuse, open, and carry on and close the conversation. Talk to the hand we used to say. <laughs> but I would be remiss if I did not draw your attention to the first poem uh, in the book uh, as well, a poem, a poem called Few. The poem covers the first page. It's about winter coming and the childhood presentiment of death. But it begins in a series of tight iambic pentameter lines. Those last few days that clear before the snow slowly fogs off the neat edge of the field behind the school from buildings all the way downtown almost. Those days that clear enough to let us see how far up the leaf smoke goes. During those days, something happened. What happens in the poem is that by the fourth line, the physical gaps, the spaces, have begun to appear in the poem. At first, between the end of one sentence and the first word of the next, but by the end of the poem, there's a gap, a place where the page's paper shines through the poem within the elements of the long penultimate sentence of the poem. And the iambic pentameter is a presence, but only an occasional one. What the poet tells me here is that form is worth fighting with, and that the stutter of consciousness, the thing bigger than form, which is a context for form, is worth fighting for, announcing, respecting. And this poem, and the poems throughout the work from 1970 until tonight show us that the resolution of the fight or the inquiry or the awkwardness of the fit is not at hand. I would suggest that the persistent gaps in the lines suggest this, that places where the flow or the poem is interrupted speak of this. I'll mention some later books. Reading and rereading City Eclogue, which is for sale, uh, thanks to our friends at University Press Books, one is struck by the presence everywhere in sight of death. Nightstick elucidations, the figure who went at his alarm clock as if to kill, before that something about waking killed him. 
Death being the mother of beauty here seems almost blithe, as does a man like a city. Those things we get from Williams and Stevens are right and are useful mainstays, no disrespect for me. But city eclogue is complicated, meaning the vision and the language are necessarily difficult. They open the city and they open death. This time, when I got to the lines in the back of the book, I was struck by the complicated address that the book makes to death. As you know, Ed Roberson has climbed mountains in South America, among other unlikely adventures on motorcycles and in, uh, uh, in uh, city aquariums. The poem in City Eclogue, Escape Training, Instructors Flying Repel, speaks of that. The poem ends this way. What should I teach? What should I say I've taught? This is an emergency maneuver done right. Excuse me, let me start again. What should I teach? What should I say I've taught? This is an emergency maneuver done right. It'll have been music once it's sung. You can't hold a note forever. You run out of breath. You run out of rope. There's a limit to all of our maneuvers. This one's cutoff is its fall, short of the height, as if the rest is hung there for you to jump as the whole thing was to jump in the first place. This is the end of the rope, the fire rather than no hope of rescue. I know how to do this without a rope, without its sound, without a landing right or wrong, to do in silence, to do in the silence of it. This maneuver, pure, I jump backwards off the burning upper floors. And reading this, Reading this, I remembered, uh, I remembered Lorca on the Duende, writing about the Duende. When the angel sees death, Lorca wrote, when the angel sees death appear, he flies in slow circles, and with tears of ice and narcissi, we weaves the elegy. But how it horrifies the angel if he feels a spider, however tiny, on his tender, rosy foot. The Duende, by contrast, won't appear if he can't see the possibility of death if he doesn't know he can haunt death's house, if he's not certain to shake those branches we all carry that do not bring, can never bring, consolation. It doesn't heal. At this moment, perhaps my favorite, at this moment, perhaps my favorite uh, in city eclogue, this poem, um, the poem was anticipated in some ways by the earlier long poem, the book-length poem, Lucid Interval, as integral music. Here he wrote, think of, excuse me, this, to the bridge, music is our art of, period. What surrounds or rather ghettos all immediate point, i.e. rivers and all that edges off into loss, dance, bridges, a stepping over in mid-air, that is, mid-music. And we're back at the miracle of singing, the sung sermons what the musical structure of the religious allowed you to think or feel, the structures necessarily including the intervals, the gaps, the structures that necessarily allude to the places where you step into midair, where you ride the context. I was pleased to discover that taking it to the bridge had made it into the Oxford English Dictionary, qualified as US popular music, to take it to the bridge, defined as to begin playing the bridge section of a song, typically following a period of improvisation. Also, to perform with increased vigor, to expand extra effort. The first quotation, this example, from 1970, is from James Brown's, Get up, I feel like being a sex machine. <laughs> Can I take it to the bridge, fellas? <laughs> Ed Roberson has the capability to address both the intricacies of race, meaning the racial wound, and the acts of identification and generosity and cruelty that are carried out and called race, and the intricacies of the natural world as well. A bit of the interview in the recent issue of Callaloo devoted to Ed Roberson's writing has stayed with me ever since I read it. The interviewer was talking, was asking about Roberson's interest in the biblical story of Joseph and his brothers, who, as you'll remember, sold him into slavery. The Joseph, he, he, he said, the Joseph thing is not resolved, Joseph thinking he was privileged and the brothers doing the human thing of reacting to that privilege. I was always thinking that there was a little bit of that that was on him too about how he used the privilege. So I was always wondering if the slavery was to enlighten him, to prepare him 
to be king or to be privileged. He was faulty. He did not have charity or mercy. Something was missing. In those days, I was thinking of God having a plan and that maybe the plan was to teach him in a large sense. I never resolved that. Sometimes when I deal with Joseph, I'm being pissed at Joseph for not being smart enough, for being a real snot and a goody-goody. Somehow or another, I have yet to figure out what that has to do with American slavery. But there's more to do with me than with culture or history. The only thing that is resolved in my mind is the image of the coat. The only thing that makes sense to me is the coat. The interviewer asks, the coat of many colors? Ed responds, yeah, it's the variety that's at the root. The root cause of the problem, or the prize to be gained, is the wealth of the variety in that coat. There's also the image of the jaguar's coat being sunlight and shadow. That particular image of the jaguar goes through all my books. He told the interviewer the anecdote of his jaguar encounter. We had set up camp, not realizing we were this close to the volcano. When we were making camp, the air had cleared and we had seen it, the volcano for the first time. That night, we had built lean-tos and had fires. We woke up during the night and the Indians were carrying on. And the one who spoke a bit of Spanish said that a jaguar had passed by to get something to drink. Thank goodness he wasn't hungry, only thirsty. But there were the tracks. The idea was that we were sharing the night together. The jaguar had passed through camp. So the image is that of the jaguar. The image is there, but you don't see him. There's much to be suggested here, I think. For one, there's the taxing of and the reading deeply of the idea of image. What images do classically in poetry is to ask the reader to see something specific. Here, the image is something else, something more complicated having to do with perception. Here, the jaguar is the shapeless gap or the reference in the trees. If the coat is the thing that makes sense in the story of Joseph, the fact the jaguar's coat, which we are not being asked to see, is the deferred resolution or interval or gap, the symbol of which could be bridge. The important that we're aware of on some other level. His poem, Imponderable Thirst, from to see the earth from to see the earth before the end of the world speaks to this, elaborates on the idea. As if we are always asleep, the jaguar's tracks are there in the morning. They lead from the forest up to the gathering of the unreal leaf work of our lean-to, lead up to our exhausted bodies already in the bags asleep. As if we are always asleep, the end comes right up to us and stares into our sleeping eyes, ignores us, and continues on our way. The tracks seem to gather around us, and the steps of some consideration then go back around and down the river and back into the forest, which we wake and look towards and see nothing. Ed Roberson's books include When Thy King is a Boy and Ate Ekan, an experimental book involving concrete and visual poems. His book Voices Cast Out to Talk Us In was winner of the Iowa Poetry Prize. Atmosphere Conditions was selected for the National poetry series. His most recent books are City Eclogue and To See the Earth Before the End of the World. He's the winner of the Poetry Societies of America's Shelley Memorial Award. The judges for the Shelley noted, noted this, not only a life, but the life inside of a life is his opus. How barriers, detours, and unforeseen associations figure into the whole experience. I think he's a great poet. Reading him is a joy. Please welcome Ed Roberson. See, see, so I don't, I don't know who that guy is. <laughs> um, I want to thank you again and thank the college, the university, for having me here as the Holloway Lecture. And um, what I'd like to do to honor that, and I've never done this before, this is kind of weird. Um, what I, every now and then, one of the things that I do is um, I'll follow my own assignments in, in, my, in my workshops. I'll say, do this, 
and it will seem interesting enough that I'll do it myself. And uh, we'll come in and then we'll have jump on ed day as well as jump on student day. So what I'm going to do today is uh, read you three poems that came out of uh, assignments to my students or came out of experience with my students. So you brought me here as a professor and I'm going to act like one. <laughs> first one I'm going to read is uh, from Rutgers. I was, um, I designed a uh, chemistry uh, program. I helped design it uh, with uh, uh, Dean Fraser Foster at Rutgers. And it, uh, we took kids who were um, tops in their schools, but the schools weren't tops. We brought them in and the idea was to mainstream them as fast as possible. Uh, so we set up this program, a really rough program that they started in the summer. Uh, they went through the summer. They went through their first year in a design class that we had, a specialty design class uh, for chemistry. And by the end of that first year, they were actually ready uh, to uh, uh, mainstream into organic chemistry. And um, we've got a whole list of doctors and chemists and folks all over the place uh, who uh, went through this program, folks that, didn't look like, uh, according to the admissions uh, office, didn't look like they should have even been at, at the school. Uh, now they're teaching in the medical, at, at, in the medical school. I, I love that. <laughs> this is one of those guys. Uh, in the program, you had to take, the, you had to take an exam. Uh, then you, you had a break, and uh, you had to go over the exam immediately. And uh, then there would be a chance to correct yourself, actually study, and then come back uh, the next day, or, or actually it was the Monday after the weekend, and uh, you had a chance to redo the exam uh, after having studied what you, what you missed. So the retake was important. Uh, this fellow came up to me and said he needed to leave right away. He wanted to go down to Trenton to the hospital. And I thought something was wrong with him. He said, no, there wasn't anything wrong with him. Uh, one of his boys, there had been a party the night before, one of his boys had gotten shot. And he was going to go down to uh, Trenton to see his, see his friend. Uh, the interesting thing is, the thing to start off the poem was he had on mismatched shoes. The shoes, mismatched shoes. They, you know, why a grown man would be wearing mismatched shoes? I asked him, and he said, what it meant was that it was a sign It was that, that they shared in the gang um, that he was with the guy all the way. And I thought, all the way. <laughs> Standing strong. He wore the mismatched shoes, he said in style, when one of your boys was gone. And it could go either way. And you wanted to say you were with him step for step, still tight. When I asked what each either of the way was, he said it wasn't nothing, just mismatched shoes. No more shamanic addressing up than that, as if he could not see what he sees to wear, what he sees is on as medicine from here, from standing strong, canonical incantation and station of the street for keeping on, his feet washed by the hands of black angels of pavement, of dark roads tiled in lynch linen, basins of shadow. He wore his mismatch with the dead as night, a night like living sun among those shades of dragging down, hooked up with even darker, each star a stare down a bore of light, each flare of gunshot, bull's eye, lights a hole through the, ga the gang of ires from start to finish of a life until that blue blocks out a sky. The night crimes pile their empty, chalked off figurine prizes into a dawn. He wants to walk away from this, this rough, odd luck. How many in his makeup brought, walking away from rope, from irons, the capture up through him, his hair, the glide to his feet, the tendency to go further in life, somewhere, a couple of decent pair of shoes. A 
Chicago, uh, University of Chicago, I had a, a, a young man in a class who um, uh, was really, I could tell, was really wanted to write uh, some images into his work, and he wasn't sure about how to do that. So I, I had one-on-ones, we called him in and we talked. Uh, he said he, he couldn't, he, he just couldn't get them out, and uh, he didn't know what they were. And uh, so we just kept talking, we kept meeting. And uh, finally I found out um, that uh, he had lost his foot. And I actually hadn't noticed it, he moved so quickly. He was an athlete, he, play, he was a tennis player, but he had lost his foot to cancer. He moved so quickly and naturally that I, I, I just hadn't noticed that he, didn't have, that he had an artificial foot. And so we began to talk about cancer. Uh, I had had cancer also. So the, the two of us began to make cancer jokes. Back, uh, <laughs> things that we saw in the, uh, in the, in the, uh, in, in the, in the ward, uh, things that broke us up, things that, you know, you just have to walk out of the room. So I got him to talking and I, I kept pointing out, uh, there's your, there's an image. He would, he said things like all the time he said it, it was like coming up to an abyss and stepping over it and not being able to step back. Ow. <laughs> Did you hear what you just said? <laughs> and we would, we would go on from there. Uh, so we, the, the game was, the assignment was, he was going to take my images, I was going to take his images, and we were going to write each other a poem. Um, I never got his poem. He got a really lucky chance to go abroad and jumped at it, and I excused him from the class. But I would really love to have heard what he had to say. Anyhow, what I'm going to give you is my poem uh, to him. A. You have at night a horse waiting outside, its crazed eyes and mane, even painted to a still life, yell action, flame burning off it, unconsumed neck and head poked like a window into the room where you are sleeping. Nightmare takes a shape, but night cramps never complete tightening into the monkey or form only location, and that only a will-o'-wisp of pain unless the move to get this maskless night wrestler off you is to peel your muscle back counter to its coil, body lock of late night channel dream. But if the leg has been cut off into sleep forever at this screen, the stabbing dream has no wake, no recoil to resurrected balancing of muscle tensions where no position is, but the static of not continuing that unstood, continues tightening its stand, deeply felt where nothing shows, nothing shows, and still is not turned off. Doubly maskless, night wrestler, bricking legs. You don't even have, legs you don't even have, and can't wait to deny. You want to get even with the happening to you. You want to put a hit on event, that particular turn of fate you want to have the shit beat out of it for you, for fucking with you, blowing off a leg that was important to you, that ditch blown in the, in the road you can't step back over ever again. And as if the hand that dug it doesn't matter. Grunts ain't shit anyhow. You want the head impossible that happened to you. You want it wiped out, erased, made not, nothing, nada happening. You want revenge on a past of something. Robert got away by way of his appearance like yours of just showing up there in just that moment to run in opposite directions from each other forever, though never escaping, though never making up a loss. Even with nothing to make up for, there is the other leg of phantom limb we run, the one still there, the limb on ordinary steps we take that cut us off, cut from that height we see ourselves to be, or maybe are, but something isn't right. This time it is the ache you can't find, whole you can't tell where it hurts. Lying down, standing, seated in any chair, there is no position in which you feel relief from you. You can't tell where, whatever it is, wakes you from waking as sharply as from sleep by pain, the pain that wakes you when you are awake. 
wakes you from wakening out of the pain, the pain of being woke is an awakening to it. Awakening to is. The unsleeping, undreaming is. The not waking from is. Is pain. Is, is no phantom. Dividing the line open across erase and redraw and renew to next. The living air between place stamp step in consequence can limb the dance points through time to time to hold on point, change between consequence, live through into the frame of closure, hemmed in, a suture hanging, point for the beholden of art. Dancer, dancer, the pain is the irreversible. This done business, this busyness of done, chopping with its clean finish on our bodies, whole to go on or not, irreversibly here and here, not by one's own hand as much as whatever blood covering your body you have fought, whatever the pain does not know what. If color is only bodily receptor is sight, where any black was a lack of whiteness, absence of worth as white self is worthy. White's black was lack of lightness, a lesser body. Black in America can be a pain. In a body of yours, you don't actually contain somebody else's phantom, but not your neck. But then your neck, strained, keeping the country's feet off the ground, contained in as you are both history and consequence and act, one growth. Or is it one stump, the hanging burn beyond the cutoff of not seeing, the grandparent in ourselves at the lynching, on the postcard, smiling, or no longer the past itch that hurts to be scratched? How do you make this here to be got at with real hands, but together in the mirror, come in from our absence, come in from our absence, both in black. There's a tradition in, in um, black culture, um, everybody sort of recognizes it as um, signifying. Um, but it's a lot more subtle and secret than first glance. Um, usually it's shared back and forth between um, black folks, but sometimes you'll hear it um, between black folks in the presence of white folks, and you discover that nobody knows except the two of you what you're talking about. So I had a Russian girl in my class, and she started the poem, May I Ask? May I Ask Where Your Grandmother Died? was the first line of her poem. And she went on to talk about Bobby Yar. She, she's Russian Jew. And in the family, uh, she's seen pictures of people. Uh, for instance, her mother and father took a wedding picture at the site, uh, just, to, just to remember. So I thought about that and made that an assignment. May I ask, and what your family secrets were. Um, one of these, one of the, a friend of mine, I told him about this assignment, and he just laughed. He said, his, is, his signifying thing that always tickles him is, um, um, may I ask how your grandmother died, or who your grandmother died, because um, the grandmother in the cellar is a way of saying we will hide what is black in our heritage. So if someone says, makes a remark to you about grandmother in the cellar, you know, they peeked your card and are, have just insulted you. But then sometimes it's just folks admitting to themselves the hardness of dealing with color in this country. And I think pretty soon you're going to um, be privy to uh, a large work uh, by Natasha Trothway, who has uh, actually taken the, the paintings that originally codified, codified uh, color 
uh, to uh, Mexican culture, and she has written a series of poems uh, about, about those paintings. So may I ask, may I ask you who your grandmother died? Her blackness you pretended we'd assume a servants in the photograph. May I ask, did she die herself? I know you all light under an umbrella, don't tan, and she could be seen as she had been made too dark for what the sun do. I saw her years ago after she died, and again today in the market. I asked her, I had to know if she was who I knew. Only things you really have to, that's to stay black and die. Black, yes, but if black leads to some pretend that you have died, except you're black and alive, who are you? She is as hundreds of years old as the stories of the lies of grandmothers in the cellar. May I ask who your grandmother died? If she died herself? I want to answer Cecil's uh, point about music. This is a poem that was in um, uh, Lucid Interval, um, and it's toward the end of the second series. Lucid Interval is two, two series. And uh, this particular poem just ends in midair. And I can see, I, I, I think you'll be able to see why once I finish it. Knowing the music never comes into it. The music's fact is a glossolalia sounds meaning. Record jacket, cover art's point, cuts its own music, different from that the magnetic pickup fit is on. Point, in these words, takes up the turning subject after the silence, after what was meant last, at renewal, a needle, not so played on meaning as on moving, rescue from blank death, deaths in other words, subject radical. As many names for the same deck as games, as human call is figurature upon those assets, and once in person. Uh, I'd like to read a, a, a series of poems from uh, a book called The New Wing of the Labyrinth, which came out just about the same time as the, um, uh, as to see the earth. But this has a completely different kind of poem in it. Uh, so I'd like to sort of read some of this sequence. Day and night don't organize anything for me. The sun is on the wrong hand and the moon on a completely different page with no feeling for which light this is reporting in, and no sense of whether the darkness is deep, falls short of escaped ending, or just begun. It all seems one long, aimless wandering. And with the cyclic lost, medications three times a day have days long, and an infection of forgets in the taking. is cuckooing already from the end of this week. This lapse is not an actual starvation, yet without a scale of scarcity to time the settings of the table into measure, if eating has no hour, no place, if there is only that meal of when youth moment, or that, that catch of when it comes whenever, and then moving on, then food is lost as an ordering. No source, nor locus, no occasion, and not fed, the framework, our improv of food, has no name. Desk grows on your desk. You pick it up, then go back to work, wherever that was going, or sometimes not, not eat at all. And the foul, 
fail for walkabout. Think along these lines of our disorder as ongoing revision of that hunting and gathering ancestry, that grab window of the pass through, that hand to hand with time, and being lost is just to organize the found we walk around in, pick them up, put them down. Our feet, we four-footed become two, become four-handed in the like tooled arrangement of our doodle of places, the pointless line for the draft banana of our destination. Think along its line, where it slips off the ledge of the paper. My penalty. My partner is penalty for the me I live with, paying late fees enough to be support of this other person in the person of my disorders, penalty for myself. He's expensive. I replace more of him than of myself if his catch-up has to always ride taxis. He doesn't pay rent unless I send him next day special class. He eats out a lot on the run. He always runs dropping items from any schedule I try making good on. My shadow dropping time from my life through that point where our hourglass bulbs flower each into the other, dust to dust, and time to eternity, and it's all paid up. After the beat, I, uh, this is a found poem. I, I, didn't, I didn't write this. I cannot fully define in this context, because it is just a tape, how much I hate that fucking message. It's monotone, it's attempt to sound military, neutral, Gordon Liddyish. It's attempt to sound as though it has no possible interaction, even a formal interaction with the person calling. The message is, this is an intrusion, you fuck, a terrible, terrible intrusion. But I'm not going to dignify it by getting angry about it or formal about it. I'm just going to respond like a piece of, of, of curved, of very badly curved metal so that you'll just fall off. You ain't even <laughs> bounce off. You'll just fall off. I don't like that message. I want that message chained. I have a mild case of double pneumonia which is being treated excessively with massive amounts of brutal and expensive antibiotic. In addition to that, I haven't had a cigar in two days. I am sensory deprived, oxygen deprived, drug deprived, and crazy. Where, where are you? You're nowhere. You're gone. You're not around. The last time something like this happened to me was when I had too many drugs and you were able to be very helpful. I think the year was 1971. Well, this kind of disorientation is best dealt with by fornication. So if you can't talk to your friends, you may as well fuck. I'm going to start calling around and seeing if there is anybody who's desperate enough to get laid that they want to fuck a pneumonia person. <laughs> You know, like some people are necrophiliacs, man. They like to fuck corpses. I don't know, maybe we'll see. Could be a Hope you're alone when you get this message. You know that. <laughs> Been reading some poetry lately and thinking about you a lot. Hope you're doing okay. Uh, did I tell you that I got a... I won't tell you, I'll just send it. Goodbye. <laughs> I had, written, I had written a poem about a bunch of guys. We, we, we stayed friends for 40, 50 years. Uh, I'd written a poem about one of the guys, and John said, well, what about me? And John is, you know, just sort of uh, our, the jock of the group. Um, so uh, he said, what about me? And everybody laughed, because, you know, what are you going to say about John? So what I did was <laughs> I waited until uh, he called with one of his messages, and I just transcribed it. That is <laughs> <laughs> and I sent it to
to him is a poem. As a matter of fact, the first time he heard it, actually, I read it in public. <laughs> and everybody knew who it was. I didn't have to say who it was. <laughs> in the middle of all that, uh, a small residue from each of all the crowds you've ever been alone in has collected in your throat. And now you've picked up silence, an immunity or prosthesis for no, and language too, so that breathing clears the passages on contact. The living rites, a scripture blank, till you, it, finishes. You've gained the language used for not speaking. You even understand the dead. Living as one who is outside doesn't leave you, only living if you're recognized. The door. It's never at the door to leave, but it's always at the door, the way the wolf is. Not just on the other side, everywhere you go, the wolf is. It's not the money at the moment, but a due date due to pull one on the moment the way the wolf is. What makes the angry difference of the sunniest street and takes it to the alley is where the wolf is. It's kill of gameness, the essence here. The issues meet every hunger ages from. Built milk to bloody meat, the way the wolf is grown in, begins as the long permanent teeth gnawing inside the way the wolf is. The series comes to a double uh, conclusion. Done thinking. This bridge has a low guardrail. This building's observation deck has a 10-story view straight down. This prescription looks like popcorn, handfuls, motor running, tank full. This road, as a straightaway, gets up the impact speed to put the rear tire in the glove compartment. The stairwell to the attic has thrown over rafter, depth, and step off ledges. The train not scheduled to can't stop. So, no, I never have thoughts. If that's what you're asking, no, I never have thoughts. <laughs> I'd like to read a little bit out of, uh, out of uh, City Eclogue. Sequoia, Sequoia Semper Varens. We are about what a squirrel size is to a tree, to this tree. We are the miles that shoe to city limits. One line we rip around getting our nut off to the city. Foot totals map, ply upward, impossible city on top of city, even down underground, layered into time. It seems to have grown from our gotten nut. The fruits of a pleasure in lifting our scale into the scale of a weight we feel we're part of. Into this other dish, we can feel rest into balance, our nature in nature, nature in us. The long established climate, the fattening of an abundant season the people pack on into a city, venerable aging of the gather into the folds, royal robe, venerable aging of the met crowd into community the self-destruction squirreled away in what grows settled. But we seem almost a fire-dependent species, like this tree, one that grows around fire, as if burn were a wire fence, a post of embedded iron, a piece of shot, a plate in our heads for the guest lightning.
The building stood a bunch of garbage odd sized barges lashed together between the currents of the railroad and the river, scuttled, sinking up ended in a gnarly sky. They are made into land people pour into to colonize as artificial reef is sunk next to dying corals on the seafloor. Such housing, something is off. The water, the heat is out of control, the land toxic. Building up more junk on more junk doesn't pay the bills and get the light put back on. The flesh form of the city doesn't move in the same time as the city's material forms move into era and monument. The lovely women styled in as no other time are not the body of this space they make, only the flow through it. And all this to river deep into and shape the city. Rosetta Stone, the populace, pours in an ocean, each say moving its grain at its one time, the corners smooth into their large design, a Times or a Washington Square, a park of the highest form of pickup, big baseball in the village, basketball in the village, a Harlem sound, and like that sound from which musics are made, the day's whole city of words is not the whole language. The kind of walk that's taking cover instead of steps, that gets to the corner and can see what's around it by the face direction target site this shooter placed, by where people look for what's against them. We slouch that walk, eye on our government, without thinking because we can't think without our common term yet, just a stink of sense that something's wrong here. We always use the word for about our enemies, dictatorship, takeovers, military class rule, compromise legitimacies. These words hide, as understood, our denial of such with exclusive meaning, by definition, never the us, or by our self-referent definition, none of these words admits us and are, still in our habit, colored only. That powerful level of segregationists the civil rights movement never reached, never guilty or active agent within the necessarily narrow focus needed to pin, never guilty of any more obvious than wanting things this way, the great way of wealth's want that moves other men's hands and feet and leaves its own clean. The weight that never touches anything, but is carried into the place it is always preparing for itself, above all movements, into presidencies, oligarchies, these people. The quiet of the house evacuates into the street, leaves all the rooms to follow the haunting, concern without yet subject. The ghost with its candle floats across the walls, revolving patrol lights, a spun radiant weapon, a nightstick elucidation, a beating without a given reason that just shows up at the door in the neighborhood, just happened to be who this time. Outside on the street, look back inside at our own windows, see the red shadow of the ghost crossing the walls inside where we live. He woke in a fight for his life, in that he went at the alarm clock as if to kill before that something about waking killed him. A terror only over was he awake, the heart racing and his first sense of time, the few seconds of panting before his head pounds, as though his days could bear him before they could beat him before they dawned, and then disappear into broad daylight as the way things are around here. It's nothing but a bunch of little guys with all their dough tied up in raggedy trucks. Ain't making no money. 
We can take that, cut the niggas' tires. The city subcontracts with the mob. Brakes howling, wild as a thing possessed, loose in the alleys. The city's garbage truck loops home, house to house, street to street, the wolf in that hour before light. It has our scent. It has our fucking jobs. Take a second and close with some things that uh, are still in typewriter or still in uh, files, and well, we'll see what they look like. I'm going to try them out on you. The Times, stringers, freelancers outstationed and all others assigned were posted in an open room off a half hall that ran the length of the building. He said he wasn't sure he even heard the bomb go off, but felt the floor tilt as one slab down, one end of the place gone. It was more a skid than being thrown, a drag down, the hall closing behind him and dropped two floors outside, still holding on to his camera. I took him to a movie once the Times reassigned him stateside. And in the preview of the upcoming features, out of nowhere, he screamed and dived under the seats. When I said, it's OK, it's OK, I was talking to the spectators. I couldn't talk to him. I've been, besides listening to things people have been saying and, and making poems out of them, or, uh, I've been paying attention to um, people in public transportation. <laughs> Seen from the bus, the couple arguing this morning on the sidewalk brings back the pass of last night, a distant storm flashing silently across the lake, a raging absence of its sound and nothing pulled left as often as is in storms, soaked in either this or that coupled sight, except an isolation swept through, though morning, freshly clothed, trapped, sticky in its explosive backdraft of heat, striking in not moving either way, away from the other. And just as lightning doesn't take cover from the return charge, and we can't make out attack from argument. She hit him. She just hit him. <laughs> there is this transparency of rough weathers, umbrella by some window as these are clearly, a seeing that discharge delivers to us speechlessly, delivers what we know through nothing we can do, window in which by certain light you can see within as well as out. This mirror, mirror of transparency, beware, is one of the not lesser daily gods, mutely all up in your face. It is not your reflection. Not aware, okay. better tell you about this. <laughs> Um, re recovering from re recovering from um, the illness, I would, I would go back and forth from um, middle of New Jersey uh, to Sloan Kettering um, up on 63rd, and um, it's a pretty tough uh, ride uh, for a while there until I got my strength back. Um, but one day uh, I got into Times Square. Uh, uh, at shuttle at Grand Central, I was coming back, and this man was on the was on the train uh, with a flute, 
and uh, they always ask you, the um, buskers always ask you, uh, you know, for money. But his speech was, uh, sit still. Uh, all I want you to do is relax, breathe, and listen. And then he started playing Balm and Gilead. I don't know if any of you know that. He started playing Balm and Gilead. Um, when he was over, there was one woman crying who said, boy, you took me back to church. Everybody else was in their pockets pulling out money to give him. And he didn't ask for a thing other than we sit there and be quiet. And by the time, I don't know, some of you may know that the, uh, the shuttle, the Grand Central shuttle, is a very short ride. So he had time to play one song. Here's my response to that. I was there, not abandoned, but been away from a long time, but then not really a place. Had dances for everything, even before feet, as trees get up and strut the wind like it a street. Make a stone talk. The ground makes sense. Know when it start, where lost or forgotten goes. Knows why I'm here, how this far is back again. How worn away, stripped clean, complicates as well as a callous road dirt scabs us up, and that there is a bomb in Gilead on the Times Square shuttle from a street musician's flute can lift this all away to such silence no one moves to get off the train. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for thank you for reading to us, and uh, thank you for uh, for coming this evening. Um, around the corner, down the hall, there is a there is a reception. Uh, right here in this room, our friends from the University of Press Books, our uh, our friend Julie Underhill, uh, is here selling uh, selling books. Buy a book. The poet will probably sign it for you, won't you? <laughs> and. Uh, the evening's not quite over yet, so enjoy the enjoy the food, buy a book, and come back, come back to see uh, uh, to see Clark, uh, no, to see uh, C. D. Wright on the 23rd, 23rd of, uh, of October. All right, thank you again. Thank you.